Hi, welcome to the Accidental Activist. I'm Shanda Master, the Serious Blonde. And tonight we have incredible guests with us and my cat, because he's coming. Oh. <laughs> okay, you know. God, your cat has the background for her first fur. Did you have that? <laughs> I know, right? He's just eyeballs when yeah. I put him up against the green stain. So welcome, Oz, my uh accidental activist, political analyst. Welcome, Whitney, from The Green Report. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. I really enjoy talking with you, Whit. The Green Report, uh, why don't you give a little rundown on what The Green Report covers? Sure, The Green Report is an environmental news channel. It started off with me just talking a little bit of politics, progressive movement, but I was trying to bring the climate change issue into it. So it was just me talking, and then uh, throughout time, I got more data driven and talking about the issues and, you know, hurricanes hitting and why they're bigger hurricanes hitting, you know, and go into details about the actual topic, for example, you know, Hurricane Irma. And then you, I give, for example, the data behind it. Okay. Because the waters are warm, you know, so I'm telling the environmental story and then I talk about the data. So I really focus on climate change than any environmental news that sticks out. Um, and I'm trying to do like a top 10 every month, you know, of because there's so many different like weather and climate issues now i'm trying to do a top 10 every month to recap you know stories you may have missed in the environmental news section so well, yeah just I, environmental news i love your show i love what tuning in because i catch something i always you know overlook or miss and i think with covid right now uh we're not talking about these things you know especially in the mainstream media it's all covid focused you know there's some terrible stuff going on while we're hitting our houses and uh, i love that you're covering it thanks for coming on you know i love that you i know you you're not the politic girl but but you step <laughs> up and you come on with us and and you got smart analysis and the fact that you know you're a millennial and your voice needs to be heard on these topics so thanks for coming on Thank oz you. why are you being so quiet tonight Oh, I'm trying to get a link for everybody that's in YouTube because YouTube cratered oh. everybody again. Oh, so I know. I'm uh, trying to pick a link and uh, because I don't see us streaming on Rockfin, but everything says it's streaming to it. Uh, but no, I'll have that up in a minute. So you guys continue. Okay, yeah. Um, are we live on? I don't see us on YouTube either. And we're on Facebook. Oh, well, hello, Facebook land. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's good to know where we're at. We try to be on all platforms. So welcome. Tonight, we're going to have a great conversation, you know, with Bernie suspending his campaign and so many conversations going on of who do we vote for? Where does your vote count? You know, dim enter, dim exit, or not voting at all. You know, we're just going to Put the facts out there what we know and our opinions of what we've seen and you know voting is a personal thing so ultimately it's your own choice but we hope to give you some insight on you know the, the sheep herding the <laughs> the yes. things that we see happening in the media Let, let's not succumb to that and let's make choices let's think let's think about the choices that we're making and, and how they reflect on you know we have to send a message even if our vote doesn't count one way or another i feel like we have to send a message, be it not voting, writing in, voting green, you know, I think all of these are ways to send messages. So uh, exactly. we got some great clips, but I'm going to see how Oz is doing before I start demanding clips from the engineer. Oh, you okay. can, you can demand clips. I will, uh, <laughs> my, my window's a little bit flaky here, but uh, I can well, do clips. So no, which, no, which, 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 okay. Which, so which go one? ahead and bring up the first one, but I want to bring up my rundown because there's a few things that I wanted. I don't want, we don't have the chat tonight and I really wanted to thank the chat. So I'm going to skip over that till we have a full chat room. One yeah, day. that's a good idea. I, uh, so we're running the Marianne Williamson one, right? Yeah. Marianne okay, Williamson. Let's first. see what we got here. <laughs> Boy, we're really, we're really cowboy in this thing tonight. I'm enjoying the hell out of myself. <laughs> well, you know, when we can't get into our, our, our beloved platforms. YouTube, our yeah, poor, our oh, we're so sorry, YouTube. Did we do we smell bad or something? Okay, here we go. They've hated me out the gate. Are you kidding? Yeah. I never even, I thought my first few shows were really mellow and tame. And yeah, shit, yeah. Man. Oh, okay. Well, uh, be sure it's not just us who are getting froze out tonight. So here we go. Uh, this is your first clip. Marianne Williamson endorses Dem leadership, right? Yep, so I'm just going to go ahead and let it roll, and then we'll we'll talk after we pause it at the 250. Okie dokie. Anne Williams, she released her 2020 endorsements, including some people taking on the Washington establishment. 
Among the 31 names listed, three notable ones, Michaela Wilkes, J.D. Shulton, and Shahid Buttar. Those three contenders all launched insurgent campaigns to unseat longtime incumbents. The list is also reflective of the ideas Marianne ran her presidential campaign on and would like to see represented in Congress. And she joins us now via Skype for more on all of this. Marianne, it is so great to see you. Oh, it's always so great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. And, and uh, one quick clarification. So Shahid and uh, Mikhail are both running to unseat Democratic longtime incumbents. Right. J.D. Shulton running to unseat yeah. Steve King, another longtime incumbent, but of course the Republican Party. Um, Marianne, what made you decide to back some, uh, some challengers to the, the people who hold positions of power in this town? I think it's obvious that the Democratic Party is not yet mounting the kind of opposition to the Trump presidency that is necessary. And I think that there are many people in Congress who have been there for so many years, and they're playing a game that I'm not sure is exactly the game we need to be playing right now. When you look at someone like Keita Haynes, Keita Haynes in Nashville, she's running against a conservative blue dog Democrat. This man has been there for 23 years. Keita is a woman who graduated from college. She was then incarcerated on a trumped up marijuana charge for three years. She came out, she went to law school, she became a public defender. This is new blood, this is new energy. This is what is necessary. There are so many people who have been there for so long and it's like their, their mindset is stuck a couple of decades back. And when you look at something like, let's say the $738 billion National Defense Authorization Act that came from the Democrats. It's time now. It's time now to really play this game in a different way and get some new people in there. Also, I think progressives sometimes don't perhaps realize what fabulous people are running. Keita mm -hmm. Haynes, uh -huh. Julie Oliver in Texas, Mike Siegel in Texas, J.D. Shulton, and he came so close last time. To, to unseat uh, Steve King, Nate McMurray in rural New York. You know, a when you look at someone like AOC, she's a star. She just bursts forth. Well, not everybody has that kind of magic, but they're still great candidates. And too many progressives, I think, don't know who these people are. So I made the endorsement list because when you look into these people, most congressional candidates do not win the first time out. They get their name recognition. Too many times we say, well, so-and-so can't win. That's not the point. Help them get their name out. And the people on my endorsement list, there are many of them who can win if we give them the support that they need. Okay. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. There is so many, you know. Okay, so where do we start on this one? Okay. Marianna once said, I didn't even know who this woman was, what, a year, year and a half ago, maybe. And then, okay, she was Oprah's friend. That's what I knew about <laughs> her, you know, that she was an advisor to Oprah. She was Oprah's guru. And I listened to her in the beginning of her campaign. And, okay, she was saying some progressive things, but I found her to be a little bit more neoliberal. But then as the campaign moved along and they started to scorn her and vote her off the island, like she says, she said, yeah, you know, she, yeah she, you know, well, she'll say it later on in the clips, but she, uh, she became a little bit more progressive. And then of course she came out and she endorsed Bernie. And so, okay, maybe she understands these things, but to say that the Democrats are not mounting the type of response to Trump. Come on. We know that by their defense thing. But my big thing was, her saying progressives are not aware of these candidates. I think it's great she's supporting these candidates, even though, let's be honest, I don't think that anybody is going to get rid of Pelosi by the ballot box, just like we're not getting ready to Debbie Washington Schultz by the ballot box. We've proven that twice now. So what how, What was your take on this, Wit, about how she just came out and said progressives just don't aren't aware of these people? Well, you said it perfectly. She's connected to Oprah. And what is her agenda I have to ask is why is she trying to be an advocate for the progressive movement? She did say some compelling things. From what I remember in one of the early debates, there were so many people on that stage, but she was kind of like that spiritual, like I want to bring love and stuff. So <laughs> yeah. she's trying to incorporate all these people into the movement. But then she has a good point where she's like, I. she did go for Bernie, which, okay, you know, there's something, she sees something, even though she's sponsored or some, has a connection with Oprah, she's not sponsored. But I don't know, I won't go there. But um, her in this clip, I don't think she should be, I just don't understand her message, I guess. is It's very mixed and she wants to go for Biden, but she wants all these progressives right. to come into the party. I said um, on the Daily Dive yesterday that 
the Democratic Party doesn't want progressives in the movement. I mean, it's a corporate party. It's a corporate party. So unfortunately, we're in that two tier system, right? You have to vote Republican, you have to vote Democratic. So they say. So that exactly. And that's what we're going to lead into. <laughs> it's just, you know, what other options are there? And she's trying, I feel like she's trying to play both fields. So both no, sides. I think you're right. I think you're right. Oz, do you think we can fix this at the ballot box? No. <laughs> <laughs> No. And I'm a foghorn. No. <laughs> no, I the, the the dim party is broken to the point of where I take you need to burn it down and start over. That's that's where I'm at. I mean it has mm -hmm. to be. It the rot, the cancer that is the Democratic Party today. And any of you who are in the party that know me can ask me this in person. I'll tell you the same damn thing. It started being corrupted back in the seventies, okay? And it, after Reagan did his trickle-down thing and pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Bill Clinton took that strategy and wedded the Democratic Party to Wall Street. Okay, this is a fact, folks. You just have to do a little history, okay? We all know mm -hmm. this. A lot of us know this. So after that, okay, oops, didn't work out so well for everybody. So who did you get for president? George W. W. I mean, W. Are you kidding me? Um, so then uh, W goes along, gets us into an unending war, big war criminal, probably one of the worst war criminal presidents and his administration and everything else. And then here comes Bar along Barack Obama. So what does Obama do? He takes on all of Clinton's policies, all of George W. Bush's policies, and then we have the housing crisis. So Obama administration, uh, what, 5.1 million people lose their houses and the bank banks get bonuses? Screw right. that shit. Right. That is the kind of not leadership that the Democratic Party needs to be burned down and start over. And nobody with. went to jail. If any party nobody was going to hold jail. anybody accountable for 2008 and, and our housing bubble, it should have been the Democrats. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. I agree. I so agree with you. Um, let's go ahead and roll the rest of this one. And we'll get a, we'll get over this one. OK, let's get over this one. Uh, it's really good. I, I got to say, I don't like part two of this clip. <laughs> By endorsing these challengers to the Democratic leadership, you're kind of touching the third rail of so much of establishment politics, which is that many of these people, because they have so much of the power, try to retaliate against powerful figures who even dare to endorse some of their own challengers. How have you thought about that in the context of your own role within the Democratic Party? They had already voted me off the island. Ah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That I'm just saying, why? No, I had already been voted off. I, that, that's part of the point here. I, I was in the belly of that beast for one year. I know how that game is played. And that's all the more reason why I'm as clear as I am that progressives, we know what happened in the presidential race. We need to now pivot psychologically and emotionally as well as politically and now say, okay, we're going to do it in Congress now. Um, that's, I believe, the only hope for the Democratic Party, if you want to know my uh, mm -hmm. honesty. And yeah. why do you feel such, I, I want you to dig into that idea of moving on sort of emotionally and psychologically, what that means, what people should focus their energy and attention on from the left, because I do think that there is a lot of despair. You know, obviously you endorse Bernie Sanders. He came so close. And then all these forces, the media, his own campaigns, you know, I think there are missteps there that we covered as well. So I don't want to just like blame it on the media, but all these entrenched forces came and ultimately crushed that movement. And now it's sort of like, okay, what, what next? What do we focus on? What do we get excited about? How do we push forward? So what is your view of that? You know, I've been referred to by some politically as the canary in the coal mine. Even before what they did, uh, they did what they did to Bernie. They had done what they had done, you know, a little microcosm to me. So I'm very, very aware. But on the other hand, we can't just sit here and lick our wounds. We don't have time. We can't just remain in ain't it awful. We have to get busy. You know, politics is a tough game. And if you really want political change, you have to be willing to stand up and, and, and do that. We know what they did in the, in the presidential election. On the other hand, I don't want to say anything that would contribute to the kind of cynicism that might make people sit out uh, the race or even vote third party because we have a menace to our democracy in the White House. Or even vote third party. Now, now let's hear what she said. She wants it both ways. She is doing this. 
shuffle of, okay, you know, we know what they did to us in the presidential election, but they're not going to do that in, during, in the congressional elections is basically what she's saying. What, how do you think that, that the younger voters are, see this type of message of staying in the party after they've been burned two elections in a row? I don't think the young party is very excited about the candidate that has been chosen. The momentum was Bernie Sanders. I mean, in my personal experience, I was a no party preference and I I didn't get involved with 2016, but then after we saw what happened, you know, I saw the, I saw the light, right? I saw Bernie Sanders, okay, this is the right movement. The, the younger generation sees it. I don't think they're gonna buy into the Biden. There's no movement behind Biden. There's no young movement. The people that come to your door are Bernie Sanders people. The people that came, well, they came, right? It's out now, but they. it was the Bernie Sanders. It was the movement. It was young people on the streets in Los Angeles that would talk about Bernie Sanders. There's. They were everywhere. Yeah. There was tons of events. There was nothing in California for Joe Biden, nothing. So I. it just goes back to, there is no movement behind Biden and the younger people are not behind Biden. Um, I'm not. <laughs> okay. No, and, and I, yeah, you're right. They're not even, they act like they're talking to the younger generation and reaching out, but there has not been one policy that I can see that reaches out to anybody that's under the age of 60. Oz, mm. I, I got to ask you, do, do you think that her messaging, I mean, we want to support these candidates for sure. I want to support these candidates if they're talking our policies, but I think she's going about it wrong. Am, am I thinking wrong about this? Uh, no, I, <laughs> if you're thinking you're thinking wrong because she's going about it wrong, then I got to say that you're right and she's wrong. Did that make sense? <laughs> right. So then I got to ask you, why didn't the rising call her out on it? Why did Crystal and Sagar kind of hold her hand through it? Because Marianne, Marianne Williamson got voted off the island. I, I, I believe um, that's exactly why that they were taking it easy on her. Um, again, they want to build themselves as a legitimate news organization. Now, if they pulled that same crap like uh, Russiagate, like MSNBS did and CNN, they would just uh, crater their credibility out of the gate, don't you think? So they're actually interviewing, letting the, the lady have her say respectfully. And uh, that's that's my view on why uh, they didn't come at her like that. If it was Jimmy Dore, he would have blown her up and hugged her at the same time. Um, so <laughs> he would have. Yeah, and he, he did. I, I think I think. And that being said, I I have to say this: when Tulsi bent the knee to uh, the Biden cabal, the DNC, and oh. Jimmy had her. You know, on she her dropped show. her lawsuit today. Yeah, I saw that, and oh. I've I've got I've got. I could talk about that for an hour, but, um, <laughs> but when Jimmy interviewed her, I believe I will say again, Jimmy looked physically in pain. He did. In that was pain. the most painful interview to watch because him. Do. Yes. They're friends. Okay. It's just like Nico and, and pasta and Fiorell. They were all friends. Yeah. Okay. That friendship was pushed to the point of, of something with all of them at some point. Personally, she bent the knee, whatever reasons, whatever. Same with Bernie. So I don't want to get into another topic. I right. digress. Back to you. Yeah, I'm going to digress too for a second and talk about, oh, I just lost it. Hmm, brain fart. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just going to name Marianna Williamson. She She's not the canary in the coal mine. She's the sheepdog in the donkey pen. I'm sorry. There's no way around it. No, she is. And, and, and this this interview, this like I said, we didn't get into the second half as far as I thought. She says, we have to get rid of the most dangerous thing in, in history. President, we got to vote for Biden. <laughs> Trump bad. Trump bad. Trump bad. But Trump, Trump, bad. but Trump, Trump but Trump. So anyway, okay. That's all. Yeah, I just, you know, we saw Tim Canova run two amazing campaigns against Debbie Washington Schultz. She's got Broward County locked down. We're never going to beat her at the ballot box. We got to wait for her to decide to climb the ladder more to get rid of her. But I, I see the same thing for Pelosi. I mean, even though we have a great, strong candidate, I just don't think Pelosi will ever allow that seat to be taken from her till she's ready to give it up. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, they are going to circle the wagons around Pelosi here if Shahid Batar 
is the second in the uh, November primary. That Barack Obama will call up Schumer. Uh, they're just going to circle the wagons around Pelosi and do whatever it takes to keep exactly. her Exactly. So. Exactly. You know, and she references AOC and says how not all these candidates can be as sparkly as AOC. Mm -hmm. But AOC... I'm sorry. She has sold us out time and time again. And you know, I'm not again one today. of those fall in line behind her. <laughs> or yesterday. She did it again today on uh, on uh, the internet. Go ahead and thing. tell them. Tell them what oh, she did. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, you, you'll articulate it better. My brain's <laughs> my brain's coming apart. And by the way, Timothy Carr's in there and he says he loves this show. Oh, um, and Welcome. And, Sarah Hansen. Hello, Sarah. Yeah. And Barbara made it over. I mean, we're getting some of our folks over. And, right. And, we don't normally go live on Facebook, yeah. but YouTube decided that we were not going to go live tonight. So we decided to grace you guys. And with, with your permission, <laughs> with your permission, Shanda, the accidental yes. activist, can we make this a standard on Facebook and put your yeah. show in the land of Oz until we develop your channel? Would that be okay? You got it. I love being in the land of Oz. Okay. That'd be great. So we will stream it here as well as YouTube when they decide to let us stream. Anyway, Again. go right ahead. So welcome to all those joining my show for the first time. I'm Shanda Masta. I'm the accidental activist. I have with me uh, Whitney Alex from the Green Report and, of course, from the land of Oz and the Daily Dive, Oz <laughs> Lafave. So tonight we're talking about dim enter, dim exit, and not voting. Where does your vote count the most? So uh, why don't we go ahead and roll into this Howie Hawkins, Chris Hedges. Oh, that's what I was going to digress about. Chris Hedges can't run because he's a foreign agent because he works at RT. Comrade, Did you hear this? Comrade Chris. Okay. <laughs> I was so stoked. Like, okay, I'm ready to volunteer for a campaign. And then I, I this morning I heard it somewhere that he can't run. Oh, so, well. so heart heartbreaking. I hope that changes soon. I would I don't know. I would call I would get my lawyers on that one. Oh yeah. So. Russian agent, right? Yeah, so yeah. Right, yeah. I digress. Let's roll into this clip. Here we go. So are we online now, Howie? Are we ready to go? Yeah, Howie. Yep, it says live, yes. Okay, great. I'm Chris Hedges. Uh, I'm interviewing uh, Green Party presidential candidate Howie Hawkins. Uh, I've interviewed him before. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can look at my interview. I did it for my show on Contact. Uh, and I suggested to Howie that today we really focus on all the arguments that are have been and will um be thrown at third party candidates uh, as spoilers, as um, responsible for electing George W. Bush, going all the way back to Ralph Nader in 2000. Uh, these are not arguments that I buy or that Howie buys. Um, but certainly, if you're watching MSNBC or CNN or Fox, uh, you're never going to hear the counter argument. And uh, nobody makes that counter argument better than Howie. Uh, and that's really the purpose of this video is to focus on uh, those canards that are thrown out against third party candidates, the whole uh, mantra of the least worst. Uh, and I would just to begin, say, if you followed the Bernie Sanders campaign, there were a series of articles in the New York Times quoting uh, the Democratic Party donor class, including Lloyd Blankfein and others, uh, who made it very clear that if Bernie was the nominee, they would vote for Trump. Uh, so the whole mantra of the least worst uh, only matters for us. It doesn't matter for them. Uh, let's just begin, Howie, uh, with the fact that uh, without question, Trump is the worst president in American history. He actually makes George W. Bush look uh, presidential. Um, he has he is carrying out an assault uh, on the rule of law. Uh, he is attempting to destroy uh, or I think democratic institutions have been degraded, but certainly attempting to really crush uh, any kind of check on his power. And then uh, of deep concern to me is the fact that he uh, is filling his ideological void with Christian fascists. That's Mike Pence. Now, Chomsky argues that if Trump uh, was impeached, Pence would be worse with probably some validity. Uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, Ben Carson, um, Barr and others. Uh, so I think we have to acknowledge the severity of the Trump administration. So let's just open by speaking about those issues before we begin to talk about our response. 
Wow, you know, he I, I know why he touched on the Trump bad in the beginning of this segment, because you always have to. The Democrats have forced us to always recognize that Trump bad, right? But but the thing is, is they're the first ones to say, we'll vote for Trump if there's a socialist, you know? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> oh, my God, that's true. Whitney, what do you think of this clip? So just in general, I thought this was a compelling interview, and Chris Hedges, Chris Hedges did a great job interviewing um, Howie Hawkins and, you know, always bringing up Trump bad. Okay, there are differences. I know we always have to touch that, and that's what's frustrating, right? right. That lesser of two evils. Okay, you know, Trump is like this okay, madman figure, like doing things off the cuff, and Joe Biden is portrayed as he would bring something, some normalcy, right? And it's that neoliberal corporatist normalcy that the progressives don't <laughs> want. Um, but Chris Hedges did a great job. and um, But it's always back to that Trump bad. And I think we need to address that. And what do these candidates, what, what kind of future will each candidate, even the Green Party, which even I wasn't really aware of. So this was kind of interesting to me personally, but you know, what does the Green Party have to offer? What Paul, they sound very similar to Bernie Sanders. Right. And that's why I wanted to run this clip so people could see it. I, I'm not campaigning for Howie. Um, you know, I haven't heard, I've heard his platform, but you know, there's the Green Party has a lot of inner bickering itself. It feels <laughs> like when I go and I check them out and I watch clips about different candidates. So <laughs> I, I tend to kind of stay away like, okay, maybe, you know, I don't want to get involved in all of that. But I think what Howie talks about, and we're going to run a little bit more of this interview. It's an hour-long interview. You go, you can go to Howie's YouTube page to find it. Um, he, they really break down why we can't vote for Biden because voting for Biden is voting literally against yourself. If if you're pro-choice, you don't go vote for Republicans. We are pro Medicare for all. We are pro environment. Yet we keep it, we keep voting for these candidates that are dead set against us. Biden has said he will not sign anything that comes across his desk. Right. You know, Oz, do you think that we have to start every conversation with Trump bad just to explain how bad the Democrats really are? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, honest. Honest to God. I mean, we are we are have debilitated our nation to the point, not we, but they have debilitated right. us enough to the point where it's all about uh, identity politics and nothing about issues or what's going to be good for our, our, our country or our planet. It's all about Trump bad, but Trump because Trump. What about policy? What about in the Democratic Party have they done policy wise? Joe Biden with his crime bill, uh, Bill Clinton with his uh, deregulation of the telecommunications, therefore screwing everybody like us right now. Um, Barack Obama propping up the banks and uh, allowing drilling around the world. Um, those are just little tidbits. I mean, the resume is so damn long that there is no good reason out there to give the current Democratic administration a vote for Jack Dukey. So, right. again, but Trump, because Trump, identity politics, is it going to happen? I don't know. Right. And, you know, Timothy Carr in the chat says that he would like to see the Green Party reach 5%. And, and that was my take on it in 2016. You know, I left Philadelphia and Jill Stein had been the only one in the streets talking to us, embracing us, talking about the issues. And that's the number one m mistake that... Democrats and even Republicans make when they look at the progressive movement is they don't realize that we are issue driven. We are not idolizing this cult of personality. It's not about Bernie. We say it all the time. It's not about Bernie. It's about our policies. It's about the policies for me. So if somebody is talking about these policies and these issues and they're the same issues, I, my ears perk up and I look. So, you know, I, I didn't campaign actively for Jill Stein, but I did vote for Jill Stein. And I saw a huge amount of the movement in 2016 pivot to Jill Stein. So to see the election results that we saw was shocking. I mean, I traveled this country from Seattle to Philadelphia, you know, up and down the, the West Coast. And I hardly ever ran into Gary Johnson supporters. So to see what Gary Johnson got versus Jill Stein, it makes you just go, hmm, you know. 
I, that don't look right. But, you, you know, we're bad poor sports if we cry election foul. So I took a lot of heat for supporting the Green Party. If you're a Democrat, you are not allowed to step out of the party if they don't bring you a candidate that represents you and support a Green candidate because now you're a traitor. So I didn't belong to the Green Party. I wasn't a Green. But <laughs> now I'm constantly attacked by the Dems. Do, do you think it's worth it, Oz, if we vote? Green Party? Is it counting? Is it helping them hit that threshold? Well, well, let me let me put it to you like this. Barbara makes a good point um, that she says, Barbara, our, hi, Barbara. Norm Chomsky, Noam Chomsky made a good case for voting for Biden. The bigger picture, three quarters step back instead of over the edge. Now, honestly, I, I, I know what you're talking about. I've heard that case, Barbara. Um, but I'll tell you a couple of things. First of all, we don't have time to just screw around and play these kinds of games. We're going to have to switch up our game completely. Now, if it's like, Shanda, what you're asking, if it's about do we vote for Green Party, get them the 5%, I'm leaning a lot towards that. I have my own feelings about how I'm going to vote, which I'm not going to say here publicly. Right. But I tell you what, Joe Biden does not get – any support from me other than maybe I'll wake up on the wrong side of the bed and say, but Trump on election day. I don't think so. He's giving us nothing to vote for except but Trump. So again, those of you who go Green Party, who join the movements for the People's Party, I guess finishing this answer out as convoluted as it is, I'm hoping that the movement for the People Party, the Burn the DNC, the Progressive People's Party, I think if we can get all those teams together and if we have to use the 5% that we're going to get the Green Party to do that, that might be a good strategy. I'm opening to hear it. But again, Barbara, yes, I do appreciate I appreciate your, your Noam Chomsky reference. And uh, I'm going to go with Jimmy Dore on that because he kind of tore it up. So... So I didn't know Jimmy had ran a commentary on that Norm interview. Yeah, yeah, that Norm interview, that that hurt. It, it hurt yeah, to it have hurt. Norm. You know, I, I respect Norm. I have followed Norm for years, and that hurt. Yeah, but, I, I, yeah, honestly, and, and Whitney, I, I know you're just itching to jump in here and light the place <laughs> on fire. But, yeah, but Jimmy's position basically was when Chomsky's right, he's really right. When Chomsky's wrong, he's really wrong. How often is Noam wrong in, in our opinion? Uh, not very freaking freaking oh, often yeah. at all so anyway that's 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 that and if you can check out that uh, interview with jimmy Dore about noam chomsky well, Whitney, what do you so think yeah trump so okay so the joe biden sphere whoever they are at this point views or his platform is trump is an anomaly right and we'll get back to we'll get back on the tracks we'll go back to whatever we had before and the argument is, you know, everything before led up to Trump, so why should we go back, right? That's kind of the argument um, Argument against Biden is that, you know, what are we really voting for with Biden? And it's nothing, it's nothing that the progressives want. There is no policy. Yes, it's always that but Trump, like, oh, yes, he would be a little bit better than the man in the office now. But what are what is a vote for Biden? What is the actual you know, what is he advocating for? Nothing, no change. There's no urgency from uh, Biden and his campaign. There's no there's no movement, right. at least not on the ground. There has been no party like, oh God, I just remember in the primaries, there was nothing on, nothing for Joe Biden in California. But he's he, the next FDR, Whitney, don't you know? No, he's, they're co-opting <laughs> Bernie. And if, if it wasn't rigged and it wasn't, you know, anti-people, the Democrats, then they would have the logical explanation that they would have Bernie Sanders as the vice president, you know, right. take the movement, take, you know, but no, it's very, it's dismissed. And that's the frustration with the democratic party is once again, they are corporatists at their core and they don't want that. But unfortunately in America, we have that two party system in, in regards to how many vote, you know, to get on the ballot, you need to right. run as a Democrat. Me, right. I wasn't, I was no party preference. I became a Democrat not truly at heart, right? That's the issue to vote for Bernie Sanders because that's what I had to do to get, and same with Bernie, you had to, he had to get on the democratic ticket to get out there, yeah. but the Democrats are at their core. You know, the evil machine doesn't want the progressive movement. Um, it's frustrating. And you know, what does 
a vote for Biden really mean? We can get into that. Right. What does a vote for Biden really mean? So we're going to go ahead and roll this clip. You know, I, I take the advice of Norm Chomsky and all those, but then you got to take these facts into consideration. Ku Klux Klan, but that doesn't really change the situation. Uh, yeah, Glenn uh, Ford calls the Republican Party uh, Trump's white man's party. Um, yeah. Well, they kind of are the Klan. I mean, Trump's father was a member of the Klan. Um, before I get into the issue of the tactic of least worst voting, which uh, the historical record, I think, quite uh, adequately exposes as utterly ineffective, I just want to tick off, if you vote for Biden, wh who, you know, what policies are you voting for? Well, to start with, you're voting against the Me Too movement, uh, and you're voting for the humiliation of courageous women, such as Anita Hill. Uh, you're voting for the architects of endless war in the Middle East. You're voting for the apartheid state in Israel. You're voting for the wholesale surveillance of the public by government intelligence agencies. Uh, you're voting for the abolition of uh, habeas corpus and due process. Uh, you're voting for punishing austerity programs, including, as we mentioned, the destruction of welfare and cuts to Social Security, which Biden has repeatedly called for. You're voting for NAFTA uh, and these free trade deals uh, and deindustrialization that has uh, brought about a collapse uh, of uh, the uh, working class, the uh, decline in wages in real terms, the loss of hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, uh, the offshoring of jobs to underpaid workers. I mean, GM opens plants in Monterey, Mexico, uh, closes plants in uh, Anderson, Indiana. All those unionized jobs are gone and, and Mexican workers are paid $3 an hour without benefits. And then all these trucks and cars are rolled back over the border and sold to us. Uh, you're uh, voting for, as you mentioned, an assault on public education. Uh, Arne Duncan was a huge proponent of charter schools in the Obama administration. Uh, you're voting for the doubling of our prison population. And as I mentioned, the tripling and quadrupling of sentences uh, and the expansion of crimes meriting the death penalty. You're voting for militarized police who gunned down nearly 2,000 people a year, mostly poor people of color, almost all unarmed with impunity. Uh, you're voting against the Green New Deal and immigration reform. Uh, you're voting uh, for limiting a woman's right to abortion. This has also been something Biden has pushed. Uh, you're voting for a segregated public school system in which the wealthy receive educational opportunities and poor people of color do not. Uh, you're voting for punitive levels of student debt. Uh, you're voting and the inability to free yourself from that debt courtesy of the Congress. You're voting for deregulating the banking industry, uh, including the abolition of Glass-Steagall. You're voting for the for-profit insurance and pharmaceutical corporations and against uh, health care for all. You're voting for these bloated defense budgets. Uh, you're voting for the use of unlimited oligarchic and corporate money to buy our elections. Uh, and you're voting for a politician, Joe Biden, who, when he was a senator out of Delaware, abjectly served the interests of uh, credit card companies like MBNA, which employed his son, Hunter. Uh, MBNA is the largest independent credit card company in the world and uh, was Biden's uh, major backer. So I just want to lay out, uh, you know, when you start voting for Biden, because you are voting for something, that's what you're getting. Amen. Tell me again how I need to vote for Biden. You know, boy, that he just laid it out there, didn't he? But Trump, oh, but Trump, but Trump. <laughs> but Trump. <laughs> where, where do you start with this? I kind of, you know, I didn't even allow any clip for Howie because I think Chris just kills it. Yeah. And, and there, you know, there's nothing Howie can say back that that tops what he just laid out there. And, you know, we see it over and over and over the terrible things that the Democrats support. And, and like right now during a pandemic, they're not willing to reach out one bit to us and even throw us crumbs right now. 30 million people don't have jobs now. Unemployment's through the roof. We're going to have a housing crisis because people are being evicted. You know, I they're not like... A, they're not talking job creation. Has Joe Biden said a word about job creation no. when this does lift? Um, you know, they're, they're not talking about anything that will help the working class, the poor. They're, uh, you know, we saw the CARES Act and the HEROES Act give how much money to the global elite and the corporations. 
to tell me that I have to vote for Biden tells me you don't understand the issues. What do you think? What? Very well said. I just feel uh, you said it perfectly. <laughs> we are go- well, so we're going to be in a second Great Depression, is what some economic um, experts or Joseph Stiglitz uh, has coined this era as the second Great Depression. We're going into it, and how are we going to react? We got Trump in office. Um, I know he's not doing much. It's that but Trump argument, sorry. But, you know, it's what is Biden, what is he going to do? He's not moving fast enough. He's not with it. He's not, he doesn't see what's really going on. He would just be, he's portraying once again that that normalcy issue. Let's go back to that neoliberal agenda. But people don't want that. And you see that with what's going on with the Green Party and um, the progressive movement, you know, our vote shouldn't go to biden right we wanted bernie sanders or someone else with the progressive platform but god it's just right right yeah. Oz, <laughs> do, you, do you think that that biden's gonna bring back normal <laughs> well no ah uh, <laughs> timothy carr really i it's up to you i don't know if you can uh he wanted to hear a little bit of howie hawkins response to chris after that is that possible or are we yeah yeah no go ahead okay about about how long do you want to run on that hey we're on facebook we're cowboying this so we're cowboying it okay i guess just tell the next segment of questions okay okay here you go timothy this this one goes out with love to timothy (laughs) by request by request from shanda yeah, that's for sure. I mean, so when people say we got to vote for Biden to stop Trump, well, what are you getting? In everything that we've been fighting for. I mean, I often get told that you got to stand down in the battleground states and only run in the safe states. But for the Greens and for working class people, people of color, young people, every state is a battleground. I mean, let's just take climate. You know, the Democrats, even those elected Democrats that supported Bernie Sanders in the primary in Pennsylvania would not speak out against fracking. They're fracking the hell out of Pennsylvania. And Ohio, those are two battleground states and they're building pipelines to uh, build a plastics, a petrochemical plastics factory in uh, or complex down in Appalachia, which is a whole nother environmental problem. Or you go up to the uh, battleground states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and Enbridge Line 5 is uh, what carries the Bakken oil that's fracked in North Dakota and also Alberta tar sands oil to be refined. And they want to expand that pipeline. And it's only the Greens that are fighting to uh, not just stop the expansion, but to shut it down because we got to shut down these, this fossil fuel infrastructure, if we're going to deal with the climate problem. And it looks like we lost Chris. <laughs> you can yeah. cut it there. Yeah, yeah. it looks like we lost Chris. Well, I think Howie probably had a lot more to say, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I suggest everybody go watch this. It is, uh, I mean, not just for Howie's responses, but for Chris's questions and commentary, because... It's Chris. It's Chris Hedges. Come on. He, yeah. That man, I go to sleep listening to him, you know, a couple of nights a week. And yeah. I, I literally get tired when I hear his voice. Now, now, <laughs> now I, I do want, <laughs> before we get, get wherever we're going here, I want everybody who is inclined to, to go watch the last interview, which was only a couple of weeks ago with Chris Hedges and Jimmy Dore. He talks about the differences of opinion between himself and Noam Chomsky. Um, they have uh, appeared on stage together. They're intellectuals. Uh, he's been on his show. Yeah, but but uh, Hedges is, I think, diametrically opposed to Noam Chomsky's support of voting for Biden over Trump. Um, but I'm not sure. But check it out. Right. And, and my final thought on that is, you know, I still respect Chomsky. Of course, he's one of the smartest men on the planet, I think. But I think he's getting older in his years and he doesn't understand the dire emergency that we are in. I mean, this whole half measures. I mean, come on. The Democrats are destroying the planet just as fast, if not faster than the Republicans, because they're doing it behind our backs. Right. Well said. 
Okay. They are anti-environment. Yeah. So. <laughs> they are. They are, Whitney. And you, of all people, that's why I love having you yes. on because that is the most important topic. I think I have grandchildren. I have children. I'm leaving them an earth that can't support life. And it's scary. You said it perfectly. It is half measures. The Democrats give half measures. That's that's their issue. They, they're like, eh. We'll give you half, but we'll still destroy the planet. They don't even well, give us half. They're, they're, yeah. They give us nothing. Yeah, yeah they're right. Nothing. They frame like they'll give you yeah, half. Yeah, they, they lie. They lie. You think Trump lies? Huh. Yeah, yeah. The Democrats well, yeah, AOC are, today said that uh, the Green New Deal's door is open for nuclear energy, right? Yeah. Wow. Okay, I didn't hear that. No, no, <laughs> oh, she yeah, did. Go check she that did. one out. She oh, did. No. I just, I, I, what I, uh, I, yeah, I did the uh, diapy and face mask thing when I heard her say that. I said, you're done. You just have destroyed your credibility as far as uh, environmental activism goes because, you know, what about, what about nuclear? Don't you understand, my dear? And, and she would try and talk her way out of it, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's a means to an end, and that end is going to end in the same shitty place for all of us. That's right. Three Mile yeah. Island, like in the eighties, here yeah. mm. it was a nuclear disaster. It, yeah. Nuclear well, is very dangerous. No, not a, no. Come on, Wit. We have we have a place called Hanford <laughs> up here, and it's no <laughs> problem. They're dealing with us. I think. The, how much have they spent, Chris? They've only spent like one hundred and fifty bucks to clean that place up, and it's getting better every day, right? Oh, it's so scary. It's this Hanford thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and and the thing is, is mining for uranium <laughs> normally is done on um, Native American reservations, oh. you know. And so not only that, we're destroying these sovereign nations by extracting this. And then we know it never goes away. Never. Way. It's here for like 10,000 years, right? So, yeah, yeah let's oh be digging up a nuclear waste that we can never, we, we have no idea how to get rid of it. You know, and I've hosted quite a few forums and uh, informational events with some of the really great activists that are fighting. And it's shocking the things that the American people don't understand about nuclear and the investment in it. it all of our portfolios are invested in it. Honeywell, Boeing, these huge companies, they're behind the scenes of this stuff. And who's behind the scenes of them? The Democrats, of course. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about, uh, let's see, staying in the Democratic Party, Dim Enter, right? And we've talked about the Green Party and how they're trying to be viable. So now let's talk about not voting. So we're going to roll into our next clip, which is Kyle Kalinske taking on Jink Uger over a tweet about not voting. Okay, Barbara, uh, sound check to Barbara. She said... Oz, your sound is low, so I hope this is better. Is this better, Barbara? I hope. Anyway, Chank, uh, uh, Kyle really nails it here, so here we go. Cenk Uger and I went at it on Twitter. Uh, I understand that it's ridiculous that I just fought on Twitter after telling you guys only last week that fighting on Twitter is an incredible waste of time. <laughs> I, I promise you, I absolutely hate from my core the idea of fighting on Twitter. I do think it's a total waste of time. And um, I, I actively go out of my way to avoid Twitter feuds. But one of the things he said, as you're about to see, I couldn't help but respond because I couldn't believe what I was reading. Now, you know, again, Jen Uger is a friend of mine and um, <laughs> we co-founded Justice Democrats together. There's a lot of agreement between us, but... I guess you could say where there are disagreements, there are massive disagreements. Russiagate, for example, I was a strong opponent of it all along. Um, he was a proponent of it all along. He since, you know, modified his position somewhat to say I'm not with the Rachel Maddow type people. Uh, I have my own um, kind of argument in favor of it. But, you know, I would argue that when you look at the conclusion of the Mueller report and what's happened since, who was right on that? That's not what this segment is about, so I digress. Um, but here's, here's what he said on Twitter and here's my reaction to it. It's about Joe Biden. So he said, Joe Biden has a thousand problems. I'll fight like hell to move him toward progressive positions. I'll almost certainly help to primary him in 2024, but not voting is still taking action. I agree. Not voting is taking action. It doesn't make you morally superior to those who make hard choices. It might do the opposite. 
Now, the thing that stuck in my craw was that last part. He says, it doesn't make you morally superior to those who make hard choices. It might do the opposite. More, morally superior. So, so he's morally superior if you protest, not vote. Now, is that the same as not being engaged as a voter or is it the same? I, you know, that's Whitney, do you think that's the same? I don't think so. It's it's a very complicated issue for me. I know they were they. So Bernie brought us together. <laughs> now Bernie's out of the picture. And, you know, what now? It's Jank shouldn't have said what he said, obviously, but God, the way he framed it and you can't put that on people it, you have to respect people's choices and i think it just goes back to 2016 right we don't want to we, we don't want to repeat but we're repeating and i think at this point like what option do we have i mean we have i see now we have multiple options but it does still take that framework if you don't vote for joe biden at least in the tyt sphere it's morally inferior not to it's it's tough um right and that's a, that's a huge problem don't you think Oz? this whole moral superiority if if you vote green party i'm morally superior to you if you don't vote i'm morally superior to you well that's arrogance on your sleeve at at, at uh incarnate uh that that kind of crap we get from from posers most of the time i i thought Chink was a real deal back in 2003 when I started listening to him from his front front yard or his front room. Um, um, to throw that down at somebody like Kyle Kalinske and a lot of us out here who've been around uh, for a long time and we're not stupid, but to throw that morally superior crap, I feel like I'm in a, in a Democratic uh, legislative or county meeting. Uh, where I'm looked at with that, oh, I'm so morally superior, and I'm the one, I'm the one that they're accusing of that shit. Um, no, um, that's a that's that's ridiculous. And uh, by the way, Chink has been off my Christmas card list ever since he, <laughs> ever since he bent the knee to the establishment in 2016. So Chink, uh, I think Kyle's getting ready to open a can of whoop ass on you. Yeah, so uh, we're going to finish rolling the, the clip on this. I'm not claiming, and nobody I know who's either not voting or voting third party is claiming that it makes us morally superior. I never said that. I never would say that. And also the idea that, well, you're not really making hard choices. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know how long it took me to come to this conclusion that I'm either not going to vote or vote third party? How do you know what I went through... And, and what my calculations were and what my standards were and what my breakdown was, how do you know it wasn't a hard choice? In fact, I would argue it was a very hard choice. It took me a long time to think about it and run through it and really calculate it. So it is a hard choice. Whether somebody votes for Trump, votes for Biden, votes for nobody, votes for the Green Party, votes for the Peace and Freedom Party, votes for the Libertarian Party, just because they don't come to the same conclusion as you doesn't mean that it wasn't a hard choice and that a lot of thought didn't go into it. In fact, a lot of thought did go into it. And anybody who's familiar with this show knows because I've explained in painstaking detail how and why I came to the conclusion I came to. So the idea, I, and this is what gets under my skin, he's making it sound like his decision to vote for Joe Biden is just like really brave or something. <laughs> He's so brave. He's so brave to vote for Biden. Jake, just, you're just the bravest. Just the absolute opposite. <laughs> absolute opposite. Uh, I, I, I suggest everybody send, uh, you know, uh, Chink a little mirror that he can keep in his pocket so he can put it in front of his face when he starts spewing that kind of horse shit. Yeah, and gosh. So there are options. And Kyle Kalinske, he's... I haven't watched him since 2017. My husband got me into him, and he's always had really interesting perspectives, but it's his choice. You know, he's been talking about politics for a long time. It's his choice, and um, he, I just don't think Kyle wants to be a part of it because he sees what's going on in the Democratic Party. Or I think Jenk, uh, he's, it's, it's that 2016, you know, you need to... Well, you know, it's not 2016 anymore, so it's it's... 
it's a different framework, but it's it's a little mirrored from 2016 is what I'm trying to get at is, yes, it's like Hillary versus Trump. And now we know what Trump is, but we know what Joe Biden is. He's been in 40 years of politics. Um, God, I just, it's, right, it's a hard, right. he's making the decision. Respect that, I guess. Right. And that that's going to be my final takeaway from all of the clips that we saw tonight. Voting is a, your, a very personal um, decision. It shouldn't be dictated to you from anybody, from anywhere of who you're going to vote for, because ultimately you're the one who has to live with that decision for the rest of your life. I'm <laughs> going to have to say for the rest of my life that I voted for Clinton in 92. I'm ashamed of it. I didn't know any better. I'm ashamed I voted for Obama. I'm ashamed I voted for Gore, but I didn't know any better. Now that I'm educated, and that's the big thing. If you choose not to vote, but you are an engaged voter, so you are educating yourself, you understand the issues, and you understand the ramifications of not voting or voting for a Green Party or even voting for the Democrats, then I have no right to judge you for that. So as long as you're engaging and you understand it's everybody's personal preference, you know? Right. Very well said. It is everyone's personal preference. And to say you're I'm merely, morally, uh, you're morally inferior for voting a certain way uh, is uncalled for. So. Oz, any final thoughts on this? Uh, I, who brought this up? I think Timothy, Tim, you, you did a good job tonight. You're uh, very engaged and we appreciate yes. it. Tim brought this up, uh, Timothy, uh, about, you know, we, the discussion. I think you and I had this discussion earlier today about uh, what's what should we do as far as how our vote goes? Should we blank that column? Should we blank the presidential and use that metric when it comes out that the uh, approval of the public is so shitty that the president of the United States uh, doesn't have any, you know, any clout like it used to? It's just a shit show. Or should we vote for Green Party, give them give five percent and get them back in the thing? Uh, I don't know. Um, truly, I, you know, I'm leaning towards blanking it. But that said, I think you, it was you and I, wasn't it, Shanda? Yeah, yeah we probably. talked about that. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, go ahead and blank it if you want or vote Green Party, whatever. But remember, that down ballot ticket is what really counts because that's the one that they have a little bit harder time rigging. But don't ask right. Tim Canova about that. Um, <laughs> that's, but uh, again, we need to. You know, local, I mean, local, like your mayor, your city council, your, and you, I know you hear this all the time, but really, truly, if we have any chance left of anything, it's these, these lower races where we can get in there. Particularly if you have the stomach to hang in the Democratic Party, get all of them, all of them that are co opted by the DNC, replace all of those turds because all they are shills for the corporate oligarchy so that's my that's my last final thought amen you know we respect everybody who's on the front lines of politics fighting for progressive issues and progressive values you know i if you're in the dem party who my hat's off to you i know what you're going through if you're in the green party i know what you're going through you know and and the not voting because you're so frustrated with all of it I understand that too. So just stay engaged, stay informed. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Facebook wasn't our, <laughs> we got here by accident tonight, but we like it. So look for us on Thursdays and Sundays, Thursday nights at eight, Sundays brunch at noon. We're on YouTube on Uphill Media, but we will be coming to you from the land of Oz when we go live from now on. And uh, we're going to have great guests next week. I'll have Georgia Davenport, who is running for office in eastern Washington state. And uh, she also is a, the head of Whole Washington, which is an initiative to get a universal health care for everybody in Washington state. Whitney, tell people how to check you out. I'm on YouTube, the Green Report environmental news channel. Talk about uh, current events that's going on with the climate and the data behind what's going on with the big storms and other uh, topics. So environmental news, the green report. Thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks Oz, I will see you in the morning for the daily dive. Check out Oz on the daily dive every morning at 10 a.m. on Uphill Media. Fun show. 
Yeah, um, and I hope you stick around a little bit after. I need to ask you a favor. So uh, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on again. I know I get a little long-winded, so I'll shut up now. No, you're, you actually were very quiet tonight. So tonight's <laughs> show or tonight's yeah. closing song is Another Day in Paradise because my message is we need to think. We need to think about how our voting is affecting these issues and the everyday people of our country. So have a good night. We'll catch you next uh, Sunday.